To give you an idea of what we're doing on the farm, a little different from what the university has been doing, uh, but uh, trying to put a little more um, practical sense to it here. Uh, this little bit of our operation, uh, we farm about 2,500 acres in northern Tama County. Um, we have swine finishing sites on three of our farms. This is the Middle Cedar Watershed uh, project that I'm participating in, actually participating in the Benton Tama area. Uh, that particular slide shows the entire Cedar River watershed uh, clear down to the Mississippi River. Uh, if you can, and I'm sure it's going to be difficult to see, I don't have the, but, but you know your geography. Um, between Cedar Rapids and Waterloo, about a 50-mile stretch there would be in that middle Cedar uh, portion of that watershed. Uh, I happen to live where the dark green area is. That's the uh, Benton Tama Nutrient Reduction Program that's going on there, part of this uh, regional uh, program. There are 16 entities that are involved in that program. Iowa Pork Producers happens to be one of those entities, uh, along with uh, uh, several other sources of funds. One I would like to mention would be DuPont. Um, in that green area there, uh, there is no less than 20,000 acres of seed corn produced every year. Uh, not all that from DuPont, but uh, a couple of the companies we won't mention. And so it was their intent um, to help minimize soil erosion, which less organic matter, um, long-term consequences to the soil, uh, you know, how they might mitigate that. So they became involved in this program, and it really makes a lot of sense. Uh, for seed corn production. So that's basically how I got started and got involved with cover crops uh, several years ago. So basically I've participated in four different areas of that particular project as well as the voluntary nutrient reduction strategy uh, over, over some time. We're doing cover crops. Um, we modified the way we apply our nitrogen. Um, we did install a saturated buffer, we'll see here in a minute, and then um, I did a nitrogen study last fall on one of our farms, or last year on one of our farms, uh, comparing swine manure to um, commercial fertilizer. So I've got, I've got some cover crop slides here I'll go through rather quickly. Uh, they, they do cover a two-year period. This particular slide here was one we did as part of the Benton Tama um, reduction strategy. We did some aerial seeding and standing seed corn uh, prior to harvest. It was seeded on September 7th of 2014 and then the seed corn was harvested. And we really had good luck with that. We were fortunate to get a good rain to get it off and running. Uh, the mix that was flowing on was annual ryegrass, um, kale, and hairy vetch, none of which I am a fan of. <laughs> but that's what the program called for. I uh, had reasonable success. I was a little disappointed in the fall growth. Um, uh, and. Uh, Especially, I guess I should say, the fall looked actually looked pretty good, but it was what came back in the spring to offer us any organic matter or cover I was really disappointed in. The annual rye just didn't, didn't come back. This is what it looked like, uh, I think, about uh, uh, mid-October after the seed was harvested. Uh, the dark green area there, of course, is the end rows, which were bare when the airplane flew it. Uh, the male corn had already been destroyed. So things looked really good there. And just a little different in the field, you can see the... Uh, from that edge of the field to the other, um, the stand was not quite as good. So this fall, uh, again, we've got about 400 acres of cover crops that we put in this fall. Uh, we've been doing this now for quite a few years. We use, uh, we like to use rye, grain, winter rye uh, is what we use. This was an ideal fall. So as soon as the pickers left the field, uh, we did some ripping of the compacted areas and then we were we spread the rye with the uh, commercial fertilizer spreader uh, we put on 75 pounds of rye 200 pounds of 0060 these particular acres will go to soybeans next year and then i used a vertical tillage tool to level the field off and it's my goal to have that field ready to plant um, obviously we'll burn it down in the spring but i want to be able to plant it the next trip with the planter and that works very, very well with seed corn. Um, I, I, uh, I, and a lot of producers up in that area are adapting that. We just felt it was too long a period of time. Sometimes you get an early 
a variety of seed corn. They'll pick it the last week in August or the very first week in September. And it's a long time till you plant soybeans next year to leave that soil exposed. And that's what really got us started on the cover crops on seed corn. So we had good growth this fall, just a couple different shots of what it looked like. Um, in uh, Actually, I think in late October already, we were taking these pictures, just on some different fields. Winter wheat is another cover crop that we use. One of the reasons that we use winter wheat in the seed corn business, a lot of times you'll have isolation areas. And if we know the fall before, or sometimes guess the fall before where you're going to need isolation to grow seed, we'll seed winter wheat and then leave it as wheat to produce grain the following summer and then we use that in the fall for cover crop seed. It really does help cheapen up the cost of using cover crop. A lot of times we have neighbors working together doing this um, and it's worked out very well. So we do use uh, winter wheat quite extensively and it accomplishes um, from a soil conservation standpoint, I think it accomplishes the same thing. I think we're probably not getting quite as much subsoil um, root development out of the wheat as we do with the rye. Just again, um, some different shots of some of the fields this fall. This one here happens to go back to 2014 again. It was on a different seed field. This one was spread with a fertilizer spreader. Uh, the day we were hauling, uh, I remember taking this picture, I was hauling liquid manure on the soybean ground uh, on the right, and uh, the cover crop had already, uh, was looking really, really well. And you can kind of see this, this is tame, mainly Tama muscatine soils uh, that does have some roll on, on a variety of our farms. Some of it's leveler than others, and some we get up to 3%. Okay. Um, the previous two were 2014 cover crop. This spring, then, we burned it down. Uh, it happened to be the same field there. Um, this one and this one, just two different angles. Uh, this was after burn down this spring, and we were planting soybeans there on May 2nd. That's pretty much what it looked like in the field. Um, quite a bit of residue. Um, we're getting a little braver in the spring. Uh, my, my son does all my herbicide application work, and he was uh, uh, always been afraid to see anything get green in the spring. Uh, but you can't be that way with cover crops. I think you need to wait as long as you possibly can. Um, we've had very good luck with Roundup taking down the rye, even at uh, that 8 to 12 inch range. And we just need to be a little more patient and sometimes it's pretty easy to get out there too early and get it done. But here we had quite a bit of residue and uh, th thought our timing was about right. Again, we planted beans into that. Works very well. Had an excellent crop out of that field. Just some of my comments that I'd want to make about cover crops as you think about implementing these. Um, what date to do the seeding and what method are big questions. The cover crops in northeast Iowa, north central Iowa are difficult for the commercial corn grower and soybean grower. It's unless you use some type of aerial seeding or some of the new technology um, with the air seeders that are on a high clearance machine, uh, I think have some, some real promise to get it done earlier. But if you're going to do that, I think you really need to be looking at late August, mid to late August, to get that seed out there uh, to have a chance of having a cover crop. When you do that, in our case, with seed corn, it's not maybe so much a case with uh, commercial corn, but with seed corn, you have no say when they're going to harvest that seed corn. So if it rains an inch or two inches the night before they harvest it, they pretty much tear up your cover crop, which is a problem, and it has happened. Uh, so, you know, that's just another consideration that you have to have. We, we just feel it's best uh, on the seed business to uh, wait till the crop is out, uh, and we've still been able to get good growth. Timely spring termination, we just talked a little bit about that. Cover crops on soybean ground going to corn. 
that's going to be my next venture, my next step. Uh, much more of a challenge, uh, especially if you're trying to grow seed corn. I think, I think it can work well in commercial corn. Um, probably, again, you might want to terminate that cover crop a little bit earlier, and it depends whether you're using a strip-till system or if you're doing full tillage. Those are all things you want to consider. But my concern goes back to that slide I showed you where we were knifing in manure. Um, I'd really like to knife in manure in a cover crop that looked like that. I think that would, would uh, have some real benefits for us. Cost and economics, uh, we can talk about that. Uh, my son, again, is a sales rep for Pioneer. Uh, his sales of uh, cover crop seed have been exploding since this project was announced in our area. But already this fall, when customers were coming in to place their seed odors, uh, the interest is really dropping off just from an economic standpoint. Not only are they ordering lower priced seed, but I'm fearful that the money it takes to put in a cover crop and to kill that cover crop uh, will be some of the first money out of their budgets, which is a concern for all of us. Um, the big thing for us on cover crops is soil loss. Uh, I really haven't had an effective way, at least to this point in time, of measuring the, what nutrients we're saving. But in my mind, if you're holding your soil in place, you're going to reduce the amount of nutrients that are leaving your farm. And so soil conservation is our number one concern with cover crops. And so I made this, this comment, uh, you may or may not always see a yield increase. Certainly we have not seen any yield de decrease in soybeans, but where we no-till into just standing corn stalks, we've been equivalent. So I can't say that it's you know, that it's, it's, Im, it's improved yield. I just don't have, I, I actually don't think it has. What I like about it is the timeliness of it and the protection of the soil. I guarantee you, uh, in my first couple of years, uh, we had some heavy spring rains after we had terminated the uh, cover crop, and it was night and day difference on soil loss and the erosion of where we had used cover crops versus where we had not used them. And so that's one of the things that convinced us to, to keep working on this. Uh, it's, that, it's that May, June time frame when you get, may get one of those heavy one or two or three inch rains in 20 minute time frame. That's when they really shine. That, that's, that's been our observation. So longer term, I think seeing and measuring results on cover crops is, is uh, something that is a, you know, data we still need to collect. Another change we did was the way we manage our nitrogen. This is pretty simple. This is something a lot of farmers can adopt. Um, we were always fall applied nitrogen. Um, I, I, I'm having a hard time getting over it because I always said that, uh, you know, the worst job you did in the fall was still better than the best job you could do in the spring. And so a lot of fall anhydrous is applied in our area, just, just uh, the way it's been. But we have more and more of our customers and ourselves as well that have gone to putting on fewer acres. Now we're not quite as concerned about getting it all done. Matter of fact, we're trying to leave, a, well, this year we ended up about a third of our acres left. But a half to 30% of our acres leave them until spring. A little more of a gamble and workload becomes a little more of an issue. But we're also splitting our application by putting less nitrogen on on both of those times, spring and fall, and then following with a, uh, some type of a second application in the spring. Uh, this is one of the tools that, that we use. My son runs a couple of these sprayers. Uh, we did buy this bar this year. And uh, this is uh, running in a field of seed corn here this past summer with that. Very effective on good farms. If you have an irregular shape field or hilly field, uh, we personally like using the dry urea products uh, with Agritain. We've had very good results with that. But this one here is, uh, you know, we can spread our window out significantly farther by, by doing that. I think this is, this is huge for farmers to adapt uh, this type of change in their nitrogen management. Okay, the third thing I did was uh, install a saturated buffer as part of the Benton Tama project. Uh, made a lot of sense to me. Uh, allowing nature to remove some of the nitrates from groundwater uh, passing through field tile before it enters the stream. 
So this is a picture of the beginning of Rock Creek. Um, this is looking northeast uh, on my farm. Uh, one of the first things we needed to do on the south side of this uh, particular creek, we needed to stabilize the bank. Uh, we had a lot of just natural push over years. Uh, this, this creek was straightened way before my time years ago. Uh, and there was a lot of pressure coming from the south. So we pulled the bank back to give the creek a little more capacity and uh, did that in the summertime. That's why the green is along the edge. And uh, this particular day, we were spreading the dirt um, back. But the beginning of Rock Creek is only one mile west. Uh, I'm standing on the gravel road here, and if you look the other way upstream, it, the water, open water is only about a mile west of us. And the rest of it is all tile that are draining into that first mile. And there's, so there's a, there's a huge watershed. There's a lot of acres come in there of, of pretty level Tama County soil. And I've only seen this dry once since 1987 when we started farming this farm, uh, or twice. I'll take that back. That wasn't, and it wasn't completely dry, but that creek only st has stopped running uh, twice. And there's only one more mile upstream from us of open water. Uh, and then this is the beginning at my place here. There's a big box culvert there on the road that comes in. And so when you get a heavy rain, we get a lot of water in a short period of time. And it was our goal to give that stream a little more capacity. And then also, to put uh, 65 feet in on each side of it into permanent CRP. So here we were spreading that dirt later in the fall. Then we uh, had agreed to install the saturated buffer. I really think the saturated buffer is something we all need to take a look at. It's not expensive. It makes a lot of sense to me, especially if you have a buffer or CRP along a stream, which many of us do. Um, and Matt showed you the slide of basically how it works. The problem with this one was I have, um, I have a, I think seven on the south side. I think there are seven tile outlets that come in to a half mile of this particular stream on just this side. So we chose one in the middle, and we estimated about 30 acres of drainage. And the tile are older than... They were put in prior to 1987, so I don't know exactly what I have there, but I knew that out that main was running and it ran quite a bit. So we're estimating that we're draining about 30 acres of just my own farm work. So it will allow us to collect some measurement on just my practices on what I do. We're not talking about your neighbors and what they're doing, which would be the water that's in the stream. So that water comes in here, um, and then we'll look at the um, box here in a moment. Uh, John, or Matt had showed you a couple of these earlier. Uh, in the slots there on the left, the stainless steel slots where that handle is, T-handle it is, is where the gates are put in. So the water comes in from the field, and it comes into that box, and it runs into these panels that are in there, and it forces it then into that uh, tile that's laid uh, parallel to the stream. From the surface of the soil to the top of the tile is 30 inches. So it's fairly shallow, it's, it's a six inch tile. And you press, you're basically pressurizing that. And again, there will be, and I'll show you in a slide in a minute of our, we're reestablishing our CRP on top of that. But then those plants will, it's, a, it's like a miniature wetland is what you're doing. The key is that you have to manage these. Um, if you get a prolonged wet period, uh, you may need to remove some of those panels go to the box and remove some so it allows less pressure on it and more drainage. The goal is not to get your field wet or black where your crop is growing, and yet to keep that bank charged with drainage off of your field. The concept it made a lot of sense to me, and I think uh, a very promising technology that doesn't cost a lot of money. So Iowa State set up, set up these monitoring wells uh, from that saturated buffer. There were nine wells there. I don't know if we'll see those again or not. Yeah, you can see them there in a the distance here this summer. Um, where it's mowed there is where the, where the buffer was put in, or the, the tile was put in, and then there's uh, those three, there's three stakes in a row. One of them you can't see in the rye there, but uh, they tested the nitrate concentration in each one of those as they approach the, the creek to see what was actually being used by the, 
by the grass. And really this first year's data I think is going to be very skewed because I had to reestablish the stand and we had good luck. Um, you know, I, this is just mowed here around the uh, saturated buffer, but we're expecting to have uh, pretty good grass growth uh, this spring on that. And believe me, those roots will, uh, they'll drink a lot of water. And one of my concerns is, you know, will it ever plug that saturated buffer? I, I think it'll be quite some time before that would happen. Uh, during a dry period when, when the roots may go into the tile, that could be an issue. But even if you had to replace that buffer, it isn't the end of the world because it, it's just, you know, it's not that costly. Okay, this is some data I did get from Iowa State here just a week ago. Um, some of the results that they measured this year from the, from the um, crick. So the, the column on the left is the um, nitrate concentration in the tile itself. And then the next three bars are those three wells in three locations as you would approach the stream. And uh, those were the, the nitrate concentrations. So we did get some removal. One of the challenges was uh, the year we had, and this comes into all of this data, every year is a little bit different, but I got a call, actually got a call from them in the spring, why isn't your tile running? And if we, we had a dry spring in our area. That those, none of those outlets along that stream were running last spring, all through planting season. It wasn't until June that we actually accumulated enough rainfall to get tile to run. So then the, the blue line represents the amount of water that was flowing through the tile. So we had a pretty good period of rainfall in June, which was wet for us. And then it moderated down to really a beautiful summer for us. We had very moderate rainfall. And the tile did run almost all summer. There was some flow, but not nearly what we had during June. And then you can see what happened uh, from mid-November on. We had a lot of rainfall and the flow really picked up. The green line is the cumulative nitrate removal in pounds. So again, as you know, it was it, as the flow was increasing through the saturated buffer, uh, we were removing nitrogen and uh, ended up estimating about 250 pounds of nitrate nitrogen removed uh, from this one small saturated buffer. This will be in place for three year period. They're going to collect data for three year periods. I haven't seen the comparison data yet because they also are sampling some of the other tile that are just coming directly in the stream like you would normally see. Uh, they're sampling that water as well. And I do also use uh, hog manure on this farm. Uh, it's the only source of nitrogen. Well, I wouldn't say it's the only source of nitrogen, but it's my main source of fertility for, for growing seed corn and then soybeans, soybeans following seed corn. The fourth, the fourth thing I did, um, something I kind of wanted to participate in, uh, was this uh, nitrogen response study. So I wanted to compare couple different rates of hog manure to commercial fertilizer, anhydrous ammonia in particular. Um, the way this was set up uh, is right here. We had manure. We had to check with no nitrogen, no commercial nitrogen applied. And then we had a check of anhydrous ammonia. Again, a, a zero check. And then anhydrous, another rate of manure. So there were seven different banks uh, in that strip there. You can see Oh, on the north side is the first one there. There were 24 row strips, used RTK. Um, we did till the soil the spring, one pass with a till, tillage tool, but we made sure that our planter was on the same uh, marks as both the manure applicator and the, and the anhydrous applicator. Um, we, were, we were right on them. The other strips are a little more difficult to see, but they're to the right of that slide, a uh, total of seven different strips. We were pretty concerned when we uh, took this photo in August uh, you know, we didn't think we were going to get much in our check um, of corn, so we were pretty kind of nervous about that. But uh, that's some of the things you have to do when you when you do a test. The manure analysis, I put a little chart in here on that. We did four summer tests in the building we got this manure from, and we did four tests while we were pumping that manure, and we averaged them out. So the analysis of the manure was 613036 per thousand gallons. We applied this fall's commercial fertilizer costs to, that, to those 
to, to that analysis. So each thousand gallons was worth about forty-one dollars and thirty-seven cents. The first rate on the first strip was four thousand gallons per acre, which is pretty typical for us. Um, you know, we're we're kind of spoiled. We we've, we've been very blessed with good crops, and if we if you know if we can't grow two hundred bushel corn, we're very disappointed. We shoot for two and a quarter, and our input costs uh, at least two twenty-five. Uh, the field average on that was 247 on where that plot was on that 80 acres was 247 this fall. So we were, you know, that's kind of, the fertility is very high. Again, Tama muscatine soil. A couple other numbers there. If you're applying 4,000 gallons per acre, you got a nutrient value of $165.38 per acre. And then you got to consider your application costs. I think... Uh, we use a penny and a half. That's pretty common in our area. If you're within a mile of your building uh, per gallon, so you got about sixty dollars an acre in just getting the manure applied. We do haul our own manure. This is a kind of a busy chart. I don't think I'm going to go into it in a lot of detail. It shows the seven different s strips, but I'll tell you the things that we were surprised on uh, on some of this data. The four thousand gallon of manure grew two hundred and forty-seven point two bushels of corn. And that would have been that analysis that I showed you earlier. Keep that in mind. The second strip was a check. The check yielded 170.8 bushels. I have to explain one thing, because I know um, I might get called on this, this one here. Um, we used herbicide carrier, or for a carrier for a herbicide was 32%. So all of this, that whole 80 acres, got applied another 35 pounds of N in the spring uh, with a liquid product with the herbicide on it. So in the, in the check, in the first number two box across or column across, there was 35 pounds of commercial fertilizer applied there. Otherwise, there was nothing else applied. The third one was 140 pounds of anhydrous ammonia, and then another uh, check with nothing but the... 35 pounds. Then I went uh, commercial again, 140 pounds of N, and then a 3,600 gallon rate. And you can see the respective yields. So in either the manure or the or the commercial corn, there was really an insignificant difference in yield. The 140 pounds of anhydrous actually, you know, was a bushel better than 4,000 gallons of manure. But what really surprised us was the yield of the checks. And we can maybe talk a little bit about that. Matt might have a comment or two about that. But it's our feeling that some of this organic, and by the way, the history of this field is important. Um, I, we kind of estimated, and I'm pretty, well, I look back in the three years of records, but every other year over a 15-year period, 15 15 period, so there were seven applications of manure. So this test was the, was the seventh application of manure on that particular 80 acres. And the fertility is really coming up. So that's every other year that we would apply it prior to going to corn. So that's a little bit of the history there. Um, again, uh, some takeaways of that particular study. Um, we feel we, can, we need to and we can afford to transport that value of nutrients to, to other locations. You've got to spend some money to get it there, whether it's trucks or whatever it is. For us, trucks work the best. I think we need to find out more information on the amount of organic nitrogen that is left in the soil after you apply 4,000 gallons of manure and grow a crop. It's our feeling that there's still some left there to use. You know, we can't take that credit with DNR, but I think it's pretty evident that there's probably a higher level of leftover organic nitrogen that lasts longer than the crop year that, um, ahead of it. And obviously, uh, we've been very pleased um, with manure application. Uh, it's a, if you do a good job of applying it, a good job of agitation, you can grow an outstanding crop. So that's uh, pretty much it. Um, this would be my closing comment that I think is incredibly important. I don't care which one of these practices you do. It may be a different one than what I chose to do. But if we're going to accomplish the goals that Matt talked about and John talked about or Sean talked about, 
uh, everyone needs to be doing something. 